Um, so hi everyone, my name is Fatima. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, it was really incredible to see such a full house, to see pictures that are both familiar and new. Uh, familiar also in the context of like we've been doing this for about a year now. We meaning um, at the moment, I really want to say thank you to folks in the corner, Priyanka, Marisha, and Melinda, without whom uh, this event really, really could not have been possible. So, thank you very much. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, where it is that we're located, where we're doing this work, right? So um, we're doing this work right now, or we're, we're meeting right now today on the lands of the Huron, Wendat, the Pigan, and the Seneca First Nations, right? And, you know, it's become really vogue in Toronto to do <laughs> land acknowledgement. Like, it's such a thing. It's how you prove social justice cred. Um, but I think I, I want to make that land acknowledgement for myself as a reminder to the importance of ongoing solidarity in the work that we do, whether it has to do with Sri Lanka or any other sort of like activist work, or really like any way that we engage with life in, on, on Turtle Island, really. Um, and that's in particular, I think, relevant to this context because today we're meeting to talk about um, the various travels that people on this side of the table have undertaken this year, but also in the context of the mass migrations, the movements, um, the mass displacement that has led to so many of us moving to Canada to living on Turtle Island. Um, and a, a mass displacement that finds real parallels in the Canadian context, right? So if we're talking about the displacement and the military, militarized um, colonization of the northeast of Sri Lanka, we find a lot of resonance with the ways in which indigenous people continue to face really extreme forms of violence in Canada. And I'm not going to recount them here, um, but I would remind you that we had a session um, actually a year ago this month um, with um, uh, Megan Scribe and Dasha Jagathi Soran talking about how disappearances are an issue that we see in Sri Lanka, obviously, um, but also very much here in Canada with the context of missing and murdered Indigenous women. So these resonances are not um, abstract, they're really practical, right? We're here benefiting from the same forms of state violence that we um, are threatened by in Sri Lanka on the island. I'm also really glad to be meeting here in this moment, in this building, at the Workers' Action Center, when Premier Doug Ford is like stripping away our rights as workers, as low-wage workers, as folks who are living on social assistance. That is a huge um, problem for racialized peoples, for immigrant peoples, for Tamil and Muslim people. Um, so to be here at the Workers' Action Center, an organization that has been very much at the forefront of radical um, worker mobilizing in the city for so many decades, um, is, is like is just such an honor. And I hope that by meeting here, we also continue to give back to that work. The attacks on workers are attacks on our communities, our friends and our families. Um, and last but not least, I know thanks to uh, the Politics of Sexual Violence Initiative at the City College of New York, and also to the Transnational Law and Justice Network, who are represented here today with Professor Xavier and Professor Garneda, who um, help fund this event. So we really rely on donations. This event is free. Um, we're really grateful to be able to feed people, to be able to allow people to come to these talks for free. And we want to continue to be able to do that. Which is to say, um, if you want to donate, you know, come here. <laughs> so um, what is the Sri Lanka series? For folks who have not been here before, really briefly, um, we're a leftist community, whatever that means, um, lecture series. We had really high hopes when we started last year that we would have a lecture like every other month. We're very ambitious. Um, and this is now our fourth session. Um, and the, the idea is to, be, is to try and map some of the social justice movements that are happening on the island. And um, speaking for myself, that felt really important because oftentimes we talk about this disconnect between the diaspora um, and folks on the ground, whatever that means, and I hope that's something that we can talk about today. Um, but really there is so much mobilizing, organizing activism that's happening in Sri Lanka across a, divergent, like a, a diversity of fronts and on a diversity of issues. Um, and I think for myself, as I think about ways to engage and continue to engage with the island, um, I want to take leadership from folks who are actually um, experiencing these issues. Um, so with respect to this particular issue, it's a little bit, uh, this particular series, it's a bit different from how we've done things in the past. So in the past we'd have like two speakers from like different sorts of um, contexts um, who would speak to each other about their various, uh, the ways that their work intersected. with a very sort of formal uh, panel discussion set up. Um, and I see some of those speakers in the room today, so thank you guys for coming back. Um, Today, it's really just more of a casual conversation between the four of us, and the four of us comprise um, some part, but not the entirety, of a group of people who collected in Sri Lanka um, in the summer 
at various places and, and in various moments over the summer, um, engage in various kinds of like research and interests, um, uh, united by a critique of the state, though perhaps divergent in the ways that we wanted to engage with that critique. Um, um, and really, I mean, I think I'll ask Nimi to speak a little bit about how that group came together. Um, but the idea now is to just sort of share with some of you, with you, some of the um, challenges, the experiences, um, the highlights of that trip. So, um, with that, I'm not going to do long bios. You've got the bios on the website, but I'll just go from uh, my right uh, to the left. Um, Professor Xavier, Professor Sujith Xavier teaches at the University of Windsor and its Faculty of Law, and I see a number of his students here today. I'm assuming you're getting credit for that. <laughs> um, we have with us also on his right, um, Mario Aroldas, who is the Advocacy Director at uh, People for Equality and Relief in Lanka, so popularly known as PERL. Um, and then um, at the very end, we have uh, Professor Nimi Garunadan, who is the founder and director of the Politics of Sexual Violence Initiative at City College, New York. So please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming our speakers to. Um, so harking a little bit back to what I had started with, maybe Nimi, could you, because you had, you know, created the sort of gathering you. You orchestrated it, curated it. Can you tell us a little bit about what made you want to start it? How did you know? What? How did it come to be? Yeah, um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm going to speak as loud as I can. In general, I'm a little bit soft-spoken, um, so I do better with the mic. But I will let me know if you really can't hear me at all. Um, this summer came out of you know when I work with my students, I tell them that you know, the ones who are constantly sort of hastily erecting these political platforms and social media, that they have to learn to sit with discomfort, right, and to marry it with kind of critical thinking. And I think this summer came out of that for me. It was, you know, the constant tension that a lot of us feel going back and forth, you know, not really being inside there, not really being inside here, you know, that kind of um, crisis of belonging, I suppose. And I think some people allow that to paralyze them. I think, you know, there is a kind of political paralysis that can happen when you get to go too far down the line of where do I belong and what should I be doing and who do I represent and all of that. But it was also to take that space of tension and discomfort and make something politically productive emerge from that, right? To say what could come out of that, that space. And in conversations with my colleagues and people who, who I've worked with, um, I so admire the work that they're all doing in different spaces, in organizing, um, in transgender, you know, uh, questions of transgender and, and um, law, questions of queerness, questions of immigration. You know, most of the people that I love who are just naturally a part of my community are doing incredible work, right? And we would both go back and we would all go back and forth to Sri Lanka, to the Northeast. And I think that this idea also came out of the question of loneliness, right? Doing this work is quite lonely. Um, when you're on the island, no matter what, you don't quite fit in, right? Even though the work is incredibly rewarding and you're engaged and you're in these communities, it is a really lonely experience, right? Um, so if we were all going back and doing research in different ways on different questions, the idea was really conceived of as a political project. If we were all in the same house, Right, the ten of us working on questions of, of what was happening in history and Islam and transitional justice and gender and ex-combatants and transgender sort of activism. Um, how would it shape our thinking? You know, how would it to be in the same space and be doing this research, but also to be able to come back and have lunch and dinner and talk about these things? How would we inform, you know, our politics in different ways? And also, also how would we address the loneliness? It gave us kind of a, a base to go out into the Northeast from that was a comfortable base, not because we were all Tamil or all from the outside, but because we all have the same politics. I should just add one thing, housekeeping note. Um, there will be papers going around if you have any questions, um, and then at some point we'll collect them on and I'll add them to the list of topics as we go through. Um, I think that that point of loneliness is um, really powerful and exactly right, because I, I hear it a lot. From conversations with, with people in Toronto, both like younger folks, like people who are in undergrad, and people who are older, the sense of like being alienated from 
broader mobilizing or from each other, even though clearly, like, looking at this room, there is just this, like, this huge interest and generosity yeah. of, of attention. Um, so maybe, could, could the others of you speak about, like, how, let, speaking specifically about this issue of loneliness, did, did you feel that going, before going to Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, did you feel like convening in the way that we did address that in some way? Did it feel different at all for any of you? So I, I haven't, um, I didn't return to Sri Lanka for a long time. I was born in, in Germany and grew up in the West. And um, I, for the first time I went back, it was in 2003, and I went to my grandma's village. It wasn't, I mean, I didn't feel lonely there. It was my village, although I've, I'd never spent any time there. It didn't really feel lonely in any way. Um, and, I, and, I, I, and I hear this a lot from people, especially in kind of England and, and kind of English-speaking countries. Um, and I think part of that is, has also to do with, with kind of the nature of migration of people for, with class and caste dimensions, which also have an impact of that. Um, a lot of the people who are involved in activism are from a specific class or caste because it allows them to study that because their parents were educated. And um, all these things do... Uh, uh, play a role in that. Um, so when I went back in 2003, I, I never felt felt lonely. I think it was after that, once I got older and you know finished university and started working. And um, 2016 was the first time I went back after the Rajapaksa regime was overthrown, well uh, defeated in an election. Um, things had changed just because I was you know I was more aware. I suddenly knew I I had a German passport. I could go into these spaces and do things that the you know people who lived there maybe wouldn't. Um, but and, I mean, I think an important aspect is so I'm, I'm a man. I, I can go into these places. I can get on a bus and go into a village and almost you know question it twice. Where I know my colleagues, my senior colleagues, and others who've gone um, into more remote places had had those difficulties, right? And they say like, oh, why, why are you going around alone as a woman? You know, you shouldn't be doing this and that sort of thing. Um, so I think my experiences are quite you know unique to myself too but um it it is it is it, it is different by 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 region i think too when you're in jaffna you feel a lot different people are used to kind of uh foreigners or diaspora being there um whereas if you go to places in the east if you go to the kind of remote places in particular and others it's it's you know people are interested in, in you being there and i i think i personally was surprised at how at home i felt in some of these places Although it was very fun, you know, people keep speaking about kind of the disconnect between the north and the east, and um, uh, even within within the Vanni and other places that people don't, you know, they're like, oh yeah, the diaspora wants one thing, and people on the ground want another mm -hmm. thing. Uh, it actually wasn't. I didn't feel that that different. Um, yeah. um, so I guess the uh, well before I start, I, I just want to thank you, Fatima, for giving us this space to kind of talk about this, and thanks, Nimi, for putting all of this together. And I also want to say thank you uh, to the Anishinaabe peoples on whose territory I now live on. And I want to thank them for their hospitality. I don't want to do a, a standard land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. I want to recognize that I'm on their territories and I'm a guest, a refugee guest on their territories. Um, so it, just in terms of the question of loneliness, um, I don't know, I, I when I... When I heard Nimi talk about it, um, it kind of took me back to some of uh, a space where I think for those of us that are queer, loneliness is part of our lives, right? And so I think in in that sense, loneliness I think has played a a very very strong uh, role in how I conceptualize the project, and I think that. That too, I'm super grateful to Nimi for kind of providing a space in which I can go back to and um, take my um, six foot four white male partner who is very hairy and who really stands out, right? And not the not the anyway, right? Maybe. <laughs> But I, you know, and I, 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 and I want us to spend some time on that, right? Because I think, you know, putting aside the emotions around it, I think, you know, especially for us as Tamil folks, our queerness, our gender, our identities are often kind of masked by colonial trajectories, and the colonialism 
that we have experienced kind of forces us to perform. Like I perform as a straight man, right? And so in that sense, this loneliness has kind of helped or has shaped our identities in some way. And, and you know, I love the way in which you characterize the inside and outside aspects of how we would move through Jaffna. Like when I was in the, in the three wheelers and talking to the thumbies and Anna, Anna say ringa, ringa, e ninja vanda ninga, yara paka vanda ninga, right? And then I would have to explain. So basically, the three wheeler driver would say, uh, "Brother, why are you here? Who did you come to see? And the and who's the white guy next to you?" Uh, and so moving in and out of those spaces, I think, also presented a really unique challenge. And I think the loneliness in some ways is also exasperated by the fact that we are settlers on a, on a settled territory and we're not allowed to talk about our identities and yet we, and additionally we have to perform according to white supremacist structures, right? And so, you know, I teach in a law school where, you know, there are all, my, all of my students and, you know, the moment that I mention white supremacy, everyone tenses up and no one wants to talk about it. And so, you know, yeah, and I think there's some dynamics there in terms of the loneliness. I think um, some of both what both of you said really tie well with Mimi's um, opening point around like the value, the generative value of tension, right? Like loneliness in the way that you're talking about it, um, or the tension of like moving in and out of being read as, as straight and then having your queer partner with you. I remember times when people assumed that I was necessarily your wife or yeah. like, you know, and I don't know what they thought Tyler was doing in the van, like <laughs> all of these questions. Right? And it's like, it's, but that tension felt useful because you were like, okay, people cut you slack in a different way. Um, I think about like times when I was in three wheelers or like in Baltic Road specifically, um, and whether I would get read. Well, I never got read as Muslim because Muslim had to look a certain way. Um, and and then when you would say that you were Muslim, people would say like, okay, well, you know, like you you're not. What kind of Muslim are you? And like, what kinds of politics can we extract from what how you present? I mean, I think I experienced that most in, in Colombo. I think actually, where there was a sense of like, oh, if you're a Muslim and you look the way that you do, you have short hair and you, you don't wear hijab, then you must be a Muslim whose politics align necessarily with like a liberal, and I mean liberal in the sense of like state-oriented kind of politics. And that to me was almost more frustrating mm -hmm. uh, than the kinds of expectations that I received elsewhere, which was like, well, obviously you should be wearing hijab, and why aren't you wearing hijab? And in some ways I found those questions less frustrating, because then I was like, okay, that's a conversation about like, how do we present our identities and not a conversation necessarily or immediately about my politics? Um, but thinking about this question of tensions then, um, were there any challenges that you faced on this trip? And I do want to talk a little bit later about like the rewards and, and the beautiful things, but what were some of the difficulties that and any of you start like that you might have experienced um, over your over the course of the stay? Was it perfect? Was it smooth sailing? So I, I guess the challenge for me was, you know, when you all three of us, we went to Muli Vaikal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys, for those of you that may not know the history of Muli Vaikal, it's that strip of land where Tamils were killed from uh, 2009, January to May. And according to the current figures, the government says that there was about 10,000 people that lost their lives, but uh, according to undocumented or according to unofficial figures, it's about 120,000 people that were killed uh, because of government bombings. And so we, the three of us, we ended up on that strip of land. And it was the first time that I had been back. And I've had a number of clients who were, uh, when I used to practice refugee law, a number of my clients were on that strip of land. And I've, I've taken the, the claims or I've written down the stories of children who are 10 years old to young women who are 19 to mothers who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s about their experience. And so when we got out of that car and, you know, we started walking towards the beach, it was this visceral moment of holy, uh, sorry, Che, uh, uh, holy F, I am standing here looking at this land that 
you know, and the ocean and the sand, and I've seen or I've, I've watched the Channel 4 video, and I watch it every time I teach international criminal law. That's how I start the course. And you can see a man being shot, and then suddenly uh, he's bleeding, and the ocean is washing away his blood. And we were standing on that piece of land, right? And for me, I don't know, it just kind of made me feel so sad. And it made me think about, you know, you know, as someone who's from a higher caste, as someone who has had the fortunes to, or was fortunate enough to be whisked away and was allowed to claim asylum because my mom and I could tell the story in the way that the Canadian state wanted us to tell the story. And then now to come back after, you know, the last time I was there was 2016 and not never having been to Muli Baikal and standing there and looking at it with the folks that, you know, who were part of this project. And, and then as we walked through the, the sandy beach, we would find pieces of cloth, uh, shoes, lap, you know, uh, children's sandals, handbags, backpacks. And a friend of ours found a, an album that was kind of shard together with images of, of a child. I, I don't know, that, that was pretty messed up in terms of, and then we're standing there as voyeurs and tourists who are there to watch and experience that pain, even though we have lost families and friends. So I, that was really, really challenging for me. And Mara, you've been a few times. Yeah, could you talk a little bit about your trip and like you, you? It was you who coordinated us being able to go, yeah. which was really great. Um, what were your hopes uh, with helping people come visit? Because I, because I remember, because after we went, I called up another friend who lived, who's from like close by, and had asked her if she could also help us get there. And she was like, I can't because I live close by and I don't want to be seen there. Like you know, because it's very, it continues to be highly militarized, right? Like you can see the the army bases um, in sight. And so she was like, that's not something I can help with. So can you talk a little bit about how you organized that, why you organized it, what the, that experience felt like yeah. for you? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of us would share the same experience in having seen that place, intimately knowing the place in a weird way, from watching Channel 4, from having followed the news in 2009. And, you know, I, I learned all these new places of all these villages in 2009. I'd never heard of them before. Um, and the first time I went there, it was, as I said, in 2016, I, I had, didn't have many contacts. We had a few contacts, but not really many. So a lot of the things I was just going in blind. I was just, you know, finding them on Google Maps and just turning up at those places. And I think it was, it was good that I did that on my own first because, I mean, it was indescribable. The first time I went there it was something that, I mean, I'd only, I know people have worked on this stuff for, for decades, but, you know, for, for someone like me, even having worked on it for seven years, it was just such a difficult experience to be on that strip of land. And I was glad I was on my own. I was able to walk around. I was, you know, uh, able to um, think. I spent a few hours there and I was just thinking to myself and, you know, the, the guy, the, the driver who took me there turned out to be a former combatant. So um, he was in the Tiger, so he was not, and he's just explaining stuff. And, oh, yeah, this is where this happened. This is where that happened, right? And, um, and I just want to say something about that, about this this guy, because he was showing me as we were driving. So it's 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 a road from Mule, uh, from Kulinochi to Muleti, which is basically from where the Tigers had their capital to the beach, and they were retreating. So as we were driving along this road, he was saying, "Oh yeah, behind that building, we you know there was a formation there, and we were fighting. Then then we dropped back to this building. So he was giving me like a kilometer by kilometer uh, break. So it got worse and worse the closer we got to the beach, and um, there's a museum there, the, um, or there was a museum at that time. They, they, Move the stuff now, but they had all the tiger stuff, the the ships, the parts of airplanes, and things like that. They had it there, and um, I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to take part in war tourism. I'm not going to go and show the army I'm going there. And they're like, oh, look, we have all these people who are coming. Even Tamils come here to look at the stuff. So I said, I'm not going. And he just laughed. He was just like, What's your problem? <laughs> He's like, He was like, This is all our stuff. <laughs> you should go look at it. So I was like, Okay, I'm this guy saying it. So he took me and he was just showing me everything. It was just such a bizarre. And this was the first time I went. Um, and, you know, as part of my job, the, what I do is, is, is you know, we, we are working on archive, we are working on collecting these sort of things and, you know, recording them for posterity. Um, 
So I had to go out again and again and again, and I just ended up, and I hated it every time in a way, but also place also kind of draws you to it in a way. Um, like I, 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 I'd never had enough time there. Like I always had to be dragged away when someone was like, okay, now, now it's time to go. Um, and of course we always, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we usually go at the worst time. It's like, oh, okay, we should have been there at 7 a.m., but yeah, we ended up at like 11. Now, we <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the military will also follow you, right? So the military would come and we'd, we'd lie about a few things. We had a white guy with us one time who was a distraction and was like, oh, yeah, he's just going to pee. <laughs> and, you know, just we, looking over here, he's going to Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's I, awesome, though, it's like, like, so the same as so, there was like, <coughs> so much debris, right? Mm. Like, uh, fights and these, like, children's toys and just, oh, God, it was, but on the other, you see, so on the one hand, you're like, just speaking for myself, it was like, okay, as an archive, these things remaining here is important in the absence of people to whom it belongs being able to take it away. But on the other hand, I don't know, there's, there's no right answer, there's no right, right way of feeling about it, and there are like, you know, um, people who, Tamil people who are like, like had set up like sort of makeshift homes um, who are attempting to move back, so it's like the space, the land, the water is like being reused, like we, as it, as is natural, as is... Yeah, they're burning works. things. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and so you, that, that, yeah. that's what I'm saying, it's like, on the one hand you're like, this stuff, this stuff, it's, it's what remains, and on the other hand you're like, yeah, they're burning things because also people need to live. Yeah. And I think, yeah, speaking to... So Mulivaikal is a village. People lived there at the time. So they were the ones who have got the war the, at the last, you know, the last few days in the last week, and they had to suddenly take in, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, but it's just, just such incredible people because I was like, yeah, at that point, you know, we were all just opening our doors and we, you know, mm-hmm. did whatever we could. And I sometimes did not bother you with the stuff is still there and like, what do you mm-hmm. want us to do we cleared mm-hmm. our path so we can go fishing um other than that because it goes on for kilometers and kilometers right it's it's not um, a short stretch of land we saw a short stretch right it, it goes inland and along the coast um but i i, I mean for me it um you get a sense of magnitude in a way too and i I hope I did, but I usually did do so. When people ask me to take them, I say, look, it is going to be tough. It is going to be difficult. Um, and uh, I mean, most people I speak to are glad that they, they, they did go because it kind of puts things into perspective a bit too. And how has how has Molibakal shaped your work? Um, I think the issue with the beaches or, the, or what comes out in the beaches, and if you talk about the trip and what was difficult, I think. For me, there's two sides, right? There's the engagement with the Tamil population, and then there's the work that we did as a group, right? So there's two sort of uh, parallel political projects there. Um, I think the reason that Malay Baikal is so intimately destructive to anyone who goes is because it reveals this intimacy of violence, right? It's what had meaning to you in those last days. Was it the cup that someone gave you? Was it the wedding photo? Was it... So it's just really that the... Everyday side of this, you know, we hear about the mass, you know, the war crimes, and the, all of that. That's all very big violence. It's like a capital D, right? But for me, having done this kind of rights work in Sri Lanka for almost two decades now, I'm continually surprised at what it is that kind of is what punches you in the stomach, or, or is like a knife, right? It's it's always the intimacy of violence, right? It's always the thing you didn't expect, right? So I, I can say, in an earlier trip, 2009. 2010, maybe around there, speaking to the people in the internment camps. I remember getting the reports of people living in there and how horrible it was, and the rapes and all of that. And then one woman said, you know, I said, well, what did you think when the war, when they said the war was over? And she said, oh, thank you, they didn't tell us that the war was over. And it was like that moment to me just seemed so fucking inhumane, like how you could not tell a population and how they these couldn't kids. tell, that they huh? and that, that they couldn't tell necessarily. Right, and they the couldn't world. because of where they were mm-hmm. and where they were, right? Yeah. So I think on this trip, um, in terms of the engagement with the Tamil population, there was so much, so much positive and so much. Um, and I remember, you know, we did these lectures, these workshops with young Tamil activists, which was the first time really that any of us could speak publicly in the Northeast about our work and about 
and there were these young women who were so active and so engaged and so fierce in their critique of everything. And sitting next to one of them at dinner, um, and how broken she was about her position in the family. And then she kept saying over and over again, in the morning when I wake up to go to work to be a women's rights activist, and her brother stays home, Mama makes two eggs for Thambi and one egg for me. You know? And for whatever reason, that moment, again, was kind of um, the intimate side of aunt that stuck with me. It was very difficult, because I think when you're engaging with the population directly, right, you have far less, far less ability to maneuver, right? But I can't change that. There's nothing, really, I know that this is our society, it's our culture, I know it's these layers of captivity that she's living under, right? Um, but on the other side, the work with the group, for me, when there was tension there, when there was issues within the group, again, that tension became productive because it was kind of a political territory I knew and I understood and was, was something I could navigate, right? Um, so I can think of really, there was one moment where I was going with Envy to meet the mothers of the disappeared who were protesting. And there was a number of folks there, and you know, people were nervous about coming to the protest because they didn't feel that they had a role or that what would they do there or it wasn't their place. You know, and that became a really interesting tension to explore afterwards as, you know, for me it was, yes, when you go there we're all gonna sit around, it's gonna be a little uncomfortable. Some people don't speak Tamil, you know, it is gonna be awkward. You know, it's always awkward. But again, I think that discomfort is productive, right? You've shown up, and it sort of gets to this idea of belonging. And, and you know, this is, is our community. There is a continuum here, you know, of if we don't go and sit there as a part of this protest, right, regardless of how uncomfortable and awkward it is, we're not automatically a part of things. We're not automatically embraced. But it is still something that we have an obligation to do, right, to engage in this politically. Um, again, otherwise you see a kind of political paralysis from this over, you know, analyzing of who belongs in what space, at what time, and what moment, representing what. But we all went there, and we sat there, and it was awkward. But, you know, when we came back, we were able to have an important conversation. So I think the difficult parts of the trip that we're engaging with, you know, the population that is, that is in this right now are always, they're just left with these untied strings because there's nothing one can do, right? But the difficulties within our group, I think, for me, were really, really productive politically. I was thinking about how, so we were in Colombo, we were in Baraklo and, uh, and Jaffna, broadly, the group as a whole. Um, did you feel like there were different, you experienced things differently? Like, how different did those spaces feel for you? Um, the politics of them, the culture, the community around some of the stuff that we were working on? I think everyone hated Colombo. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> that wasn't, um, why, though? Maybe, why? <laughs> Maybe we can talk about the politics of that. Why do you think that was? <laughs> Go for it, yeah. Colombo feels like a, the Dubai airport now. Yeah, it's, it really does. And I, I don't know, for me, my my father and my, my <coughs> sister both made their, they made their living by working in the NGO world in Colombo. <laughs> And so I know the culture in Colombo, and I fucking hate it. They're just assholes. Right? And it's... Don't hold back, man. Just say, say what? Don't hold back. Okay. Just say Forget Che now. Yeah, yeah sorry, Che. Che. Sorry, Che. But, you know, and, and, <laughs> and the, I think the, the, I guess, my... Let, let me try to kind of touch, intellectualize and not stay away from <laughs> profanities. Uh, I... I I, I guess my discomfort with their, with the ways in which the Colombo elites behave, is that they replicate the colonial structures that that they have learned from their masters, right? And often, you know, for those of us that are coming up from the, you know, the north or the east or wherever, we're told, oh, don't replicate the Tamil nationalism because that's bad, or don't be too pro LTTE because that's bad. Or, you know, and like there's this narrative that's constantly being invoked to create this inside outside space. And often, you know, if you're part of the NGO world, then you're told, well, you better toe the line, otherwise, you won't get the funding. Or you better toe the line, or you won't get the invite to the embassy to schmooze with all the 
you know, so and so's. Or if you don't tow the line, you won't get the next big thing at, so that we can tokenize you. Right? Yeah, it's funny because, like, when, when I was a child, so my family lived in Saudi Arabia for about 10 years, and um, it was very easy to travel between Saudi and Swansea because it's close by. It was like a, what, two or three hour flight, um, if that. Um, so we would go every summer, and Colombo was one of, it's like the happiest place for me. Like, we stayed with family and friends, and it was great. It was interesting going back then in my 20s and trying to reestablish, like, my own sort of personal relationships outside family mediated ones in the city because I really struggled to find people who I had, like, sort of any sort of common political ground with. And I think fundamentally then, Colombo, the problem was a class, for me anyway, it was a, a problem of class. Um, and kind of in the way, like, it was like Dubai now. Like, they, there really isn't a place for the middle class, as far as I could see, in Colombo to just meet. Like, there's this one park, um, th that huge park, where, like, this was clearly the place that all young people took all their dates to. It was hilarious. You'd go and you're like, okay, Tomo Singli is Muslim. Everyone is here on a date right now. Um, but that was the only public gathering space, as far as I could tell. Otherwise, it was like fancy coffee shops everywhere, like where tea costs like five Canadian dollars in Sri Lanka. Um, and so then I was like, I don't know where you meet people versus in Vatico and in Jaffna, where my language skills were definitely like a challenge, but still I felt like I was, I had community, whatever that meant. And for me, community meant like a, a community of friends, people who could um, mediate for me, who could look out for me, who could introduce me. Um, and people were really generous with introductions in a way that in Colombo it really didn't. And then that became a thing around politics, like the liberalism of Colombo. And I use liberalism not to mean, to very much mean not leftism, not progressive politics, um, was very much like, I remember I went to some, that talk that we went to, what was it, the memorial talk? Mm. Yes. It was uh, the Neelan. Neelan the, yeah, Neelan. yeah. And I refused to go. Yes, you did refuse to go. Uh, <laughs> and you're like, why are you going? And I was like, because I've never been. I'm curious. Let me go. Um, and afterwards, someone was like doing introductions, and they were like, oh, you should meet so-and-so, because, you know, Muslim women on Muslim issues, whatever. I was like, okay, fine. Uh, and this woman was telling me, she's like, you know, we're doing work on FGM. Uh, this is like, we got this like huge grant from the UN on FGM. And I was like, oh, that's, that's really interesting, because like, I've like never heard of it as a thing in Sri Lanka, which is not to say that it doesn't happen necessarily. And I think among like born Muslims, it is a thing among among Muslims in Sri Lanka. Um, but I was like, oh, okay, cool. Just um, and I genuinely did not mean this as like a, a pointed question. I was like, what is what is the word in Tamil? And she was like, I, I don't know. Um, what? How are you doing this? I didn't say this to her, but I walked away. But I was like, how are you doing this huge research project on a very popular topic? When I say popular, I mean popular among funders. And you don't know the words that people are using to describe the thing, the phenomenon that you're researching. It's because there's tons of money for it, right? And that is the thing that people are more likely to research. So going back to me for the question around tension for me and the difficulty that I continue to feel around Sri Lanka issues, it's like the thing that I wish there was... Funding, or maybe I w I'm glad there isn't funding for this, is like thinking about Tamil Muslim relations. And like that is not a conversation that really happens in Colombo at all. Um, but it happens, I think, in the north and the east in ways that are like also really heartbreaking. They aren't easy at all, but they were happening in a different way. And I think that was for me why I was glad when I was not in Colombo. Like there was people I could talk to, um, people who had a different relationship to the war, who weren't as surprised that, you know, the state would turn around after 2009 and, like, turn their attentions on Muslims who weren't as maybe as so surprised by the ways in which when Rohingya Muslims were brought to Sri Lanka, they were attacked as well. Um, but I, th I mean, I think what you're saying, I mean, for all of us, it's about being able to have an authentic politics, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of is a through line in your life's work. And for so long, it was like, if I was going to engage in Sri Lanka, then I was going to completely morph everything about myself so I could work on the Tamil cause. I was going to suck it up with the uncles and I was mm -hmm. going to, you know, pretend to be happily married and I was going to do all of these things, right, just to do the work. Mm -hmm. And this, mind you, this is 20 years in, right? This is not like, you know, all of a sudden. But it was also, you know, all of these things you know, we were talking about yesterday in a conversation, they take political energy, right? And for us, political energy is emotional energy. Right. All of these things, the performance of being this, you know, this time in Jaffna was probably the first time where I was like divorced and I was there and where they would order a beer and they would hand it to Mari and I'd be like, it's my beer. I want the beer. <laughs> <laughs> here, you know? But it was the first time in 20 years that I felt like I could, yeah. I could stop doing that because I was tired of the performance, the energy it took. And it was the same with Colombo. After a while, I realized like, 
could never, like, I, you wouldn't catch me anywhere near a UN meeting on Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. or, you know, the version in the U.S., or Save the Children, or any of that shit, right? Mm -hmm. So why do I need to check in, in, in Sri Lanka? And I hope for the sort of next generation of activists who are doing this, you know, it doesn't take 20 years, because I think I wasted a lot of time, right? Because mm -hmm. you either do the political work, and then whoever is meant to follow you, you know, will engage with you. Mm -hmm. Or you spend all of your time trying to bring everybody along with you, and that includes Colombo Civil Society and the uncles and everybody else, and that takes all of your political energy, right? And in the end, you don't do the political work. Mm -hmm. So it's about, you know, I think being able to, to create this authentic politic across your life's work, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's in the Bronx, whether it's with indigenous people, whether it's, you know, on the island, you have the same politics, and you're okay acting it out. Mm -hmm. Why do you hate Colombo? <laughs> <laughs> um, plenty of reasons. I usually don't spend any time in Colombo. I fly in and, uh, I mean, because I'm at work, I have to meet with, with the embassies and everything. But, um, I mean, I, it is civil society to some part. And I, it's, there is a sense of arrogance in Colombo, right? It's, it's just this self-satisfaction of, hey, this is, we are westernized, cosmopolitan people, and this is all fine. And they do see us as jungle bunnies, right? Tamil people. Right, and Muslim groups are something too. So, especially when people from the diaspora come back, there's a sense of um, you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be the one in DC speaking to the State Department, or you shouldn't be in London and do this. Right? They, they feel encroached, like they, that their kind of territory is encroached. Right? That we're doing things that you didn't, but you didn't go to. I don't know what the schools are called, but there's like Oxford and Cambridge, basically in Colum Columbo version, and they're so proud of them. Right? And <laughs> Royal and Saint. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to know. <laughs> I was just saying. <laughs> so, um, and I think that, I, and I noticed it pretty early. And now, you know, I went to, when I went to first, I was reaching out to everyone. Right? I was emailing everyone. I was like, hey, I'd like to meet blah, blah. They meet, but there's this very condescending attitude as soon as I realized, oh, you are a refugee. Your parents are, you know, from a village in, in you know, somewhere in Bergedo or somewhere. You're not, you're not really one of us, right? Because they're okay with kind of the elite tunnels in some way. Uh, a lot of them are elite Tamil section. Um, and I think that was interesting for me for my, for my class and class background, I think, also. And I, I come back to it because it's, it's, it is important, especially in Colombo, there is that social divide, right? Um, amongst Tamils, too. Um, and I just, I just couldn't stand it. And I think, to some extent, this is also why Jaffna is probably my least favorite place in the Northeast. Because in Jaffna, it's, 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 it, it, is, it is, you know, all this... Bullshit that people say about, oh yeah, no, class is all that's bullshit. Like, it's still very much there. And this, um, um, Jaffna was like Colombo, like 60 years ago, like Jaffna was, you know, there were people going to Oxford from Jaffna at that time, right? 60, 70, even 100 years ago. So it was a very elite place then too. And I think some of that arrogance still hasn't left the place. Um, so for me, I mean, the East, the Vanni, even places outside Jaffna town are just so much more real in a way, right? In a, a, I've been thinking about that. Like when I when I was in the east, like so, my father's family is from Portugal, which is a a, a, a town on the coast of Ampara. Um, and yeah, I always feel most comfortable in Zadipo, which is interesting because you know, like I'm conscious about what I'm wearing and which parts of the city, and like you know, am I going to visit family? Like, what am I going to wear? But I felt definitely just more comfortable in this piece than I did in Jaffna, where it was so much more surveillance and harassment. Um, but I've been wondering about like the difference between like hospitality, so people would be open with like, for example, one of the things that I am wanting to, I don't like to use the word research because it makes it sound very academic and theoretical, but I think it's just like something that I keep coming back to, is like there's this moment in 1990, right? So 1990 for me is a really important political moment because um, a couple of things happened um, with respect to the Tamil movement in, in the island. And, uh, it begins, I, in my political chronology history of the, the conflict, um, that that moment that I'm speaking of begins when the Tigers enter uh, a mosque in Kalsankudi um, at uh, one evening and they kill all of the people at prayer. So about a hundred and a hundred odd people, um, including children, boys and men, who are killed. Um, and subsequent, subsequent to that, then, the Tigers evict Muslims from Jaffna, right? So this is the big expulsion that happens, and which we now see sort of the return coming. Um, and so what I wanted to learn about was, like, what, does, what, what repercussions has that had in the East for Muslim-Tabon relations? What would that... And 
to imagine also an alternative future, what would things have looked, how might things have looked had those moments not happened, right? Like what might Bangla Muslim solidarity look like now? What might Bangla nationalism, Muslim nationalism look like on the island? Were it not for these like really violent places where we, you know, fell apart. And one of the things that I learned was, um, in fact, the, the Karpankuri mosque at violence, as, as documented as it is, had followed another attack early in a, in a town called Irabur, which is not far, where the, where the killings then had occurred through knife attacks. Um, and people talked about that more. They were like, that was the thing actually that hurt us more because with a knife, you're, you're actually physically closer to people, right? Like that violence felt more hurtful in a different way. And so I'm like trying to like reconcile these moments of like really severe harm of like death um, with also the fact that like people opened their home to me to tell me these stories. Bamal and Muslim people would talk to me about these things. Would talk really, I, I can't say really openly because there was a lot of fear, including among Muslims from other Muslims about open, talking about these things. Um, I don't know how to reconcile that hospitality with these political moments of like real like intercommunity violence. Like when I say that I feel most comfortable in the East, it's also a comfort with that kind of particular form of violence where I'm like, we did this to each other and yet we live next to each other and yet we continue. And I, it's not perfect now by any means. There's like real concerns about the way the Islamophobia is emerging um, and all, like the way the BBS is coming in. But like, I know for, I still I still keep coming back to that like what does it mean when we feel comfortable or people feel comfortable with each other like the slack that I was cut as like a Muslim woman who's like clearly like some sort of child and unmarried so like clearly you're a child um, and we will talk to you in a different way than perhaps if I had lived if I was still living there with my family um, and the different ways that I might be surveilled because I think that keeps coming back to the question of like how do you move and what kind of paralysis might you get into around identity politics of like I must be perfect, like being queer and like being to some extent like people are looking closely enough visibly queer in Jasper and trying to like navigate those tensions. <coughs> like how does that stuff continue to inform your work even now that we're back? Um I was for me at least I I think about or I push our students, you know, I don't I'm not as familiar with it in, in Canada, but I know that in the US I feel that the contemporary political moment, um, the identity politics that's taken hold has been really problematic for us. And what I saw was these fractures amongst women of color, right? That you had a number of, of South Asian women who were joining Black Lives Matter, and then you had in their classrooms they were engaged with their black colleagues who would agree with the refugee ban. Right? And they weren't able to understand this, right? Because they were supposed to be allies in this Black Lives Matter, right? Um, and what you had is just these smaller and smaller boxes of, of belonging, right? What it was to belong, and you're not queer enough, you're not Muslim enough, and you had the, the who was replaced with, or the why was replaced with a who, right? I would ask if the class was over full on gender and violence, why do you want to take this class? And the answer would almost always be because I'm trans Native American. Why do you want to take this class, right? But it was I am, therefore I'm oppressed, and it was it was really problematic. And I think with our students in the program that I run at City College, what we're pushing them to understand is that identity is both by birth and by lived experience, right? And I think that um, the identities that are formed by violence, for me, the political through lines are much stronger. Mm. Right? When you consider the identities that are formed in a moment of rape, or the political identities that are formed in mass violence, right? All of those things form a kind of politics and they connect people to each other in ways that escape some of these narrow boxes of identity, which is not to say that those don't matter, those, those are a part of it, right? The violence happens because of that, because of those categories, right? Um, but even if, I mean, you're, I'm constantly surprised in the work on the island, right? There was mm -hmm. ex-combatants in, in detention who had very, very close relationships with the Sinhalese women soldiers who were who were monitoring them, because you know, and this is work that I did in Africa as well. You find that the the role of being a woman in the militant movement and how difficult that is in that culture, mm -hmm. being in a military culture, yeah. becomes a, a basis of a kind of understanding between them. Right. So you see a lot of Sinhala uh, women soldiers and Tamil women soldiers having some some connections. Similarly, in Nigeria, you had Nigerian 
uh, women in the army who were connected to the people, the women they had brought into detention, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you'll always find these surprising connections, but I think it's, for me, it's part of the political work to unearth these, mm -hmm. right? Because they are more lasting than these, you know, kind of social media solidarities that they're creating, um, because the experience is so, it's like this intimate wound, right, that forms something inside of you. So when you build from that place, I think that in your in Sri Lanka, it's kind of, if you're Tamil or Muslim, everybody has had these experiences of violence, right? And that becomes a place from which to start a conversation, right? Without automatically saying we're all going to be, get along or we're all going to whatever, mm -hmm. right? So. I want to ask, because Sujita also meant this earlier, but okay, so in these moments of violence, a politics can emerge. Not necessarily always, I guess, a, a progressive politics. Like people can can go the other way. One of the the strategies that has emerged um, has been a turn to international law, right? And you've talked about the UN embassy meetings. Can you talk to us about your feelings about the, a reliance on international? Law? What? Are, why do we turn? I think there are you know useful things that come of it, and there are useful reasons that people engage um, with the UN bodies. Um, and do you see any limits to that work? Maybe we can start with. Because I am the international lawyer, I guess. Uh, uh, so I, I guess I, I have to be honest and just kind of say that my belief in the law today is not very good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry for all my students who are here. I, I, I think I've already told you that in class, that I don't really believe in international law. Why um, not? And Well, and I think in some ways... Uh, so there are a number of reasons. One is, you know, moving from the now to 2009, international law has failed the Tamils. Mm -hmm. The promise of the utopian future that was articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or if you go back to the League of Nations and the covenant that we're all born equal and free, it's not true. And I, I know I was just in Ramallah in, at Berzait University in October uh, uh, with my colleague Reem Bhakti uh, and Mudar, and I was part of a panel on uh, human rights uh, in and, uh, international law and the Universal Declaration. And, you know, even in various spaces, people are kind of aware of the limits of law and the limits of international law. What are those limits? And I think the limits generally, and we can we can kind of, you know, I can unpack it a little bit by saying, well, in order to kind of think about the benefits of international law, you have to ask, well, who created it? And it was created by a set of European nations, and it was set up to kind of benefit them. So people of color, indigenous people, were never meant to have the benefit of international law, which is why Sri Lanka, there is nothing. Right, in terms of transitional justice or international prosecutions, etc. Right, and so I don't know. I think we have kind of Tamils generally have bought into the myth that law can save us, mm -hmm. and that's not true. Mm -hmm. Law will never be the answer because law is the tool of the oppressors. Mm -hmm. We are all sitting on the traditional territories of indigenous people, and we benefit from the the uh, the settlement process that has unfolded, right? And so law is the way by which that happened. And international law is the, that's the way in which this was produced. And so for us as people of color, as former coolies or slaves or, uh, or workers or whoever, to kind of turn to the law now and to believe that it will give us emancipation, that it will free us, it's not true. But at the same time, I'm reminded of something that an indigenous uh, scholar uh, said in the 80s where, you know, we have to learn the white man's language. We have to learn how to play the game because we need immediate things now. The immediate thing right now is to stop Raja Paksa from coming into power. Maybe law can help. And Mario, Pearl does a lot of work at the level of like international advocacy, um, state lobby. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and yeah, um, I think the work that I personally do at, um, I mean, I've been doing kind of work at the UN, at the Human Rights Council, I think, before I even started with Pearl. Um, for me, it was never about, I never, I, I didn't believe that, uh, I mean, listening to Sujit makes me, oh yeah, this makes sense, but I never really believed, oh yeah, this, the UN is really going to give us 
an international court, right? It's just not how it works. Uh, but I think for us, it's more about the, the processes that happen and the um, small shifts that we may be able to do. Um, and what we have been able to do is by building these co relationships. I mean, I lived in DC for three years, and you know, on Sri Lanka, with the, we were quite close to with the State Department. I think not that they always listen to us, but there are things that we can raise, right? So if there are people under threat, if there are certain communities, there are you know, this particular thing that's happening, um, that we have had an impact, right? Where we have were able to change people's lives or can uh, protect protect some people or even get people out, right? So um, this is not just the U.S., but you know, different different countries and. That thing, I think it's it's in the now, in what's happening right now. I mean, that's the only reason I, I continue to engage. Because of the, yeah, I mean, ideally, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> we wouldn't have to rely on these structures, right? Just a quick question. Maybe in ten minutes, um, we'll start collecting questions. If you have any, um, please feel free. And Nimi, you also participated at, at the UN level. What was that like for you? Um, <clears throat> I think it was faith destroying. I think it was. Um, no, I mean, we were, you know, talking yesterday also in that with other young activists about, you know, is your work a pushback, right? And I had to think about it a little bit, and I thought, no, it's not. Because if I were to make my work a pushback, these institutions are rigid, right? And they can't, they can't absorb it. They're not malleable. And I know because I worked inside of them, and I tried to work inside of them, right? Um, I think that our role now is to kind of... Um, thoughtfully expand the political imagination of the resistance because because all of this transitional justice, you know, there was a conference at Harvard that they flew all of us in for and it was like two days mm -hmm. of sitting there and I really thought by the end of two days I would know what transitional justice was. And I, I had nothing. You know, it just, there's no, but it's like democratization, it's like reconciliation, it's like empowerment. Um, it's this language that the West uses to dismiss any sort of real real political work being done, right? And um, sometimes you'll talk to these groups of, you know, engaged human rights folks on Sri Lanka, a lot of, you know, Westerners, and, you know, at one meeting they said, well, don't you think you're, you're preaching to the choir? And it took me a second because I was like, no, I feel like we're different, but I couldn't, you know, <laughs> I had to think about it, and then I was like, you know what, I think choir is a performance. And it's quite easy to all be in unison because you were taught the words. And you're all really good at it, right? Like, you're good at performing this. You're performing a kind of politics. But you're not actually doing the political work, right? Because if you were, you know, we would actually see some change on the ground. When you talk to transitional justice folks about this idea of, like, you know, we to build faith and, and faith-building measures. And maybe you start with how you broke the faith, right? These, it's not as if people have forgotten that they sat there and watched you walk out of Kilimanjaro, right? That they appealed to you, right? And my fear is, and it continues to be, that that as massive as these industries are that are created, right? The advocacy and the and the jobs that they have and all of that, um, they're a really powerful force, mm -hmm. right? And they can suck up all of the political energy of the movement. You know, all of us were a part of the OISL and. You know, if you give all of the statements and all of the documents and all the witnesses to the UN, then something will happen, right? Think about the number of people we put at risk by getting those statements, the number of reports, everything that went into that. You know, and then the UN has everything, and then what? You know, you've gotten to the top of this mountain, and then, you know, and that was, you know, those conversations that we had with Navi Pillay when she came and she congratulated the Tamil community and, you know, keep going. Keep, you know, keep going. Why? Why are we going to keep engaging? Right, with this process. It's it's the space between where these folks exist and where the people that we talk to live is so massive that I don't actually think that we can do work into this space. Mm -hmm. I think you have to choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. And for me, after a while, in terms of, again, the limited political energy each of us had, mm -hmm. I couldn't keep banging my head up against mm -hmm. an institution that was not going to shift. Mm -hmm. right? Even the well meaning people within it are going to be absorbed by the force of the institution and its politics. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, for me personally, I could no longer engage. I don't engage with them anymore. So, just building on that point about the the voices that we have, or the international community has asked for, uh, asked to come forward, the the transitional justice movement after the end of the war had pushed for a number of UN resolutions, and then we ended up with the consultation task force that went around the country, 
asking people to come forward and give their testimony. And that was a brutal process mm -hmm. where I've, I know some of the victims who came forward and who test, who provided evidence and provided their stories. And then the consultation task force mm -hmm. compiled all of that material into this document and the president wouldn't even receive it. Mm -hmm. And so Chandrika, the former president, received the document, the, the consultation, and eventually that task force asked the president to set up a number of transitional justice mechanisms. They set it up and want, there are now two or three mechanisms and one of them is the Right to Information Commission. And that's the only body that's kind of doing something. And I, I don't know how much money the UN has thrown into the space. And if I count the number of foreigners in the country, you can tell by how much they get paid, how much they're, you know, what kind of work they're doing. Mm -hmm. And usually it's about sixty to seventy thousand dollars a year, which is, you know, so many percent more than what someone makes in Batiklo, for example, right? To write these reports, collect these these pieces of information that just sit out on the internet. You can Google it and find it. But no one does anything with them. So this is, you know, for me, this is what international law it's does. It's the money and the extraction of trauma. Right? Mm -hmm. Think about how much bloody trauma we've forced people to constantly, that I have personally, you know, and, and what happened. You know, Hillary Clinton's third level intern read that report and what? Mm -hmm. It's not, I won't do it anymore. I won't ask people mm -hmm. the details of the trauma because I know it happened. And, I'm not going to write that part, but the only part that I think that is how they became politicized, what the political mm -hmm. pathways are at this point, but I'm no longer going to mm -hmm. buy into this defining the Tamil through their trauma. Mm -hmm. but, they, but they extract this trauma, but then they always have this expectation on you as the victim mm -hmm. uh, to perform this uh, yeah. depoliticized kind of victimness, right? Mm -hmm. And um, even for us as an advocacy group, it's always like, oh, so... Yeah, but surely you condemn the LGT or you condemn Tamil Nadu. The Tamil crazies, they say this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we just have to kind of draw the clear line. No, we're not going there. Mm -hmm. You do all this thing. You can watch and help and did all this. Now you want us to put down a flag? You really that bothered by the flag? They're not really, right? But it's about control. It's about mm -hmm. you fitting into, into their democracy. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the question of trauma, how does that influence how we do archiving? So we're not, we're hearing a lot of critique around like UN archival processes and how extractive and then ultimately useless that has been. Um, I know for myself that I, I want to be involved in some sort of archival process because there's like so many, there's so many gaps in knowledge, like in my own knowledge and in, in knowledge in Toronto, which is the city that I live in now, like not gaps like even across like different cities in Sri Lanka itself. Um, so just for myself, from an educational perspective, I want to be able to say, like, this thing happened, and then this thing happened. Though really, I think ultimately for myself, maybe I'm more interested in, like, the emotional sort of elements of things and the political elements, as you said, Nimi, of, like, and then how did that politicize people? Um, where did they go with that next? And, and what are their political aspirations broadly? Is there a way to do that that is conscious of trauma and re-traumatization and conscious of, like, how people tell us stories and what stories people don't tell us. Like every time someone tells me something, I'm also curious about like what doesn't get said to me, when will it get said to me, um, what kinds of what does trust building look like to get to that point, and also, am I really just here to like ultimately get a story, or is it about building a relationship and building something where I am also, you know, part of this relationship, part of this friendship? Like that's that's the thing that I felt a lot in Sri Lanka because I remember being in Badagro one day at a dinner that had been convened by. Um, uh, uh, an activist who's, who lives in, in who's from Jaffna but now lives in Badakro and she just a bunch of women from around the world had were in Badakro for a conference that week and uh, I went and uh, one of them asked me so a bunch of them asked me um, so what are you here for what are you researching and I was like I'm not researching anything I'm just here to spend time with friends and family and that actually really threw them like that was like that's not how you as an academic, not that I identify as an academic in that space, but like that wasn't really clearly why you were here. They thought I was hiding something from them, and I don't think I was really. Um, but how do you go about documentation? All of you are involved in varying levels, uh, like the different types of archiving. How do you do that 
without getting in trap with some of the stuff that you critiqued with respect to the UN. Um, I can say that again, I would go back to once I stopped working with these groups and had to sort of triangulate her trauma and all of that, mm -hmm. the rape, and for me, it is the intimacy of violence, right? And the intimate violence is not re traumatizing. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea mm -hmm. that she kept coming to over and over again that he got two A's and I got one, mm -mm. right? That is not, it's not something that's going to traumatize her. The idea that you know, the cell phone that the army gave her, and she talked about the cell phone two, three times in a conversation, that is a kind of intimate violence that tells me something about mm -hmm. her, tells me something about the context, tells me a lot about power, right, and what's mm -hmm. happening, mm -hmm. but it need not traumatize her, right? Mm -hmm. The cell phone doesn't, doesn't do anything to her, right? Mm -hmm. But I also think the conversation is, the, the method of research, conversationally, is a very Western thing, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a natural thing for Tamils to discuss trauma. Mm -hmm. Right, and in some senses, I think that that we have to sort of broaden our own scope of what information gathering looks like. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not always conversation. Mm -hmm. I think the archive process that we're starting, we're developing an archive at Stanford. Um, it's an archive on the legacies of violence in South Asia from a civilian perspective. Right, it's never been sort of a, a South Asia archive um, with Kashmir, but essentially from the point of view of, of people's struggles. Um, but I always say that you know the boxes that we've gone through and the boxes that are sitting in my living room that Mari and I have worked through and Sujit and you've looked at and you know it's the most comfortable that I've ever been doing research. But I also feel like I'm learning so much. And we have you know these letters that went in the '70s to Nelson Mandela from the movement, right? You have articulations of Tamils on what was going to happen to the Rohingya, you know, back in the 1980s. We have pictures of women in bell bottoms protesting at the White House. Right, women in saris and bottoms protesting at the White House, you know, against genocide. You have the artwork of the fighters. You have the pamphlets of the dissenting movements. Right, you have all of these materials, all of this thinking, all of this knowledge, all of this experience in art that was just in someone's basement until they dropped it off. Right, um, and I think I've learned so much from from this, but also from if you must do a conversation from. The way that when we were in Jathmine, it was it, I don't think people were doing like research. They were like, but it was experience of it. Like it was listening and watching and, and watching how the restaurant reacted when 10 of us walked in and what we looked like and what it felt like. And, but even, you know, sitting at lunch, and this was my hope for that summer, mm. and not having gone out that day, but sitting there and having my friends come back to eat lunch and talk about what they had seen or done that day, what they had eaten, what they had. You know, there was so much information. There. So I think it's kind of, on us to start divesting from this Western way of approaching it and, and finding different ways around trauma to, to, to understand, right? Not to, not to research, but to understand. Mm -hmm. How did that come up um, for you, Mario, around the Ariana reports that the organization produced? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so we did a few joint reports mm -hmm. with, with Ariana and Pearl. Did. Um, and then and initially... First time I went back, I, I didn't think I'd be producing reports, right? But I just kept finding myself having conversation. And I think I'm, I'm privileged because I, I, I'm fluent in speaking Tamil also. And um, it was quite often that people assumed I wasn't. I was from from there, at, at most from Colombo or from Jaffna. Um, and uh, even if they didn't, at first, you know, people may have been a bit cautious. But as soon as we start speaking, a sense of familiarity crept in. So. Um, Conversation was very easy flowing, and I, I didn't have any of the academic training and research. Mm -hmm. I still don't. I just have conversations, and I take notes. I just speak to people, right? So there was never a set of questions or things like that. And I think that that worked. That actually worked um, quite well. And it, when, I, when I have tried to do it in a more academic kind of structured way, it, it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. I hate it. I kind of hate the kind of um, the forms of, of, of having these questions set beforehand. Uh, and I think it also affects the, the relationship or the way you are engaging with people. Um, and and I think it is that the relationship. I think I'm 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 surprised at how many people I'm still speaking to, mm -hmm. right? From from then from these remote places, who you know, the, and it's I think it's a cultural thing too. But you know, you get you get a message in the morning and you know, a flower and a good morning <laughs> from like five six different people from from um, uh, various how do areas. How respond to those messages? I, don't <laughs> want to say I just I just wonder what every three days is saying. Oh, um, good morning, Akka, or good evening, or whatever, right? I tried to type in Tamil to make it a bit easier. 
Yeah, it's a lot of emojis, a lot of kind of gifs and you know, glittery cats like, and things like that. I'm like, I'm like, what's up? Yeah. How are you? Yeah. Good, you? Yeah. Uh, but, but it helps. So when there is an issue, yeah. they do come, they do ask, right? And, yeah. and um, you know, people have always, my family, my mom, like, oh, you know, people are going to ask you for money, you should be careful, blah, blah, blah. But people never ask for money for themselves, right? It's always been like, hey, there's this person. Who needs some help? Uh, when you come next time, we'll take it to them, and you should you should do something. These are not activists or anything. These are just people in, in random villages and towns. Um, and uh, I think the relationship is is Im- important. Um, and yeah. That that phrase that you these are not activists reminds me of something. I was having a conversation with Sylvia McAdam at the law school the other day at Windsor Law, and and she was like, you know, I really hate the word activism because you know she's a one of the founders of um, I Don't Know More here in Toronto, uh, here in Canada, um, and she's Cree, and uh, and I was like trying to understand why, and she's like, well, you know, if I was in a house and someone broke into my house and I tried <laughs> to get them out of my house, would I be an activist? <laughs> would that yeah. make me an activist? Like it's actually quite condescending, yeah. and I th- and I thought I was like that was for mm-hmm. me a real paradigm mm-hmm. shift. It was really helpful, um, and I think about that too, like in the context of Sri Lanka, like what we think activism looks like um, and what activists look like when really like living under that degree of militarized violence where like you go buy an ice cream in at, you know in Jaffna town and it's like mm. oh you're in line behind remember we were in mm. line behind that like 20 Sinhalese like soldiers mm. um, and that's just a, a normal part of your life like to the extent that you know trying to trying to deal with your with the person breaking into your house is activism that trying to <laughs> is activism do people, maybe we can start collecting questions now um, while we uh, continue. Did you want, did you want, no, did you want, yeah. yeah, so I guess it, just in terms of trauma, I, I don't know, I, I think I'm with Nimi, or I, I think I kind of agree with everything that's been put on the table. I've stopped asking about people's stories. Mm. And I think in some ways, this is probably after I moved to Windsor that uh, a lot of my teachers kind of gestured that I, sh- you know, we should start thinking about thick relationships as opposed to mm-hmm. these drive-bys where you drop in and you get someone's story and you leave. Mm-hmm. And so more and more, I'm kind of really interested in fostering, generating thick relationships with people where, you know, we can do this, mm-hmm. where we can have really intimate, emotional conversations and not feel ashamed mm. about the traumas that we carry with ourselves. Mm. And so th- I guess that's the first part. And the second part is, you know, in some ways, I, I guess the academic training that I've received has forced me to be so apolitical in mm. terms of my own subject position, in terms of how I think about myself vis-a-vis the law. And so now, I guess... Now that I've been doing this for a while, my my go-to space is to kind of turn back and to kind of think about the internal aspects of like what does my trauma look like? Mm. What is you know what is? And I, I think you know in some ways that's what I really loved about this project, and it's probably why it's so emotional. It, is that it kind of forced me to think about well, what what did what did I feel when I left my my mother's home when I was nine and we were forced to kind of take a bus through and kind of go through these checkpoints with the IPKF soldiers who were threatening us with their guns and this was the time of the IPKF and you know and this the role of the Indian state itself right like we often believe that the Indian state has played a a, a generous role vis-a-vis the conflict but it actually hasn't and you know, so for me, it's kind of like thinking back to my own experiences, situating it in those spaces or reflecting on those spaces and then coming out with maybe something else. And 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 putting that on paper, I think, you know, a lot of the, the writing on Sri Lanka has been about this idea of trauma. And I, I don't want to read it anymore. Mm-hmm. I just don't want to do this work anymore. And it's super boring, and it's traumatizing, and I, I don't want to read about this woman who was raped by five different people. I And it just feels so violent 
right? And so maybe, I don't know, I, I'll let you know how it is after I finish writing this, but, you know, in terms of just reflecting back mm -hmm. and thinking that through, I think might give me some way to think about trauma. We have a lot of actually really amazing questions. Um, maybe I'll start with, so this one, I think we've talked, some of us have talked about this in the past. Do you think we've done enough to connect with the Sinhalese community post-war? And do we need to, and do you think that's a critical part of achieve, achieving change in Sri Lanka? Thoughts? I'm going to admire that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Post-2009, at the, especially at the Human Rights Council, um, Tamil NGOs, Tamil groups, and Sinhalese groups are actually working quite closely together. Um, but it's, it's why I said before, there's this expectation that you leave your politics at home, right? That you stop being, that you buy into this idea of one Sri Lanka or, you know, the unitary state or, you know, Sri Lanka is a single Buddhist majoritarian state and it, 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 it is throughout the state structures, right? Um, and, uh, but at the time, because Rajapaksa was in power and he was a threat to Sinhalese liberals too, um, I would say they used us, right? In 2015, when the election happened, they dropped us like that, right? All of a sudden, they wouldn't invite us to be on panels anymore. They, they, they just stopped. Um, and since my first trips, when I was engaging with them at first, now I don't bother anymore because there's just no reciprocation in one. But also when we did ask them to do things, saying like, hey, you have more space now, so why don't you go out into the South and screen the Channel 4 documentary or things like that, right? We can't do that. If you're going to be allies, then you have, you're, you're going to have to put your, your, yourself on the line. Um, there was no willingness to do that at all over the last three years. We've always been kind of chastised as people who rock the boat and cause trouble. And you see that now, again, with Rajapaksa's kind of uh, return. The divisions between the Sinhalese and geo community and the Tamil civil society, in a way, have up, up further than they've been since 2009, I think. Um, and I, I just... I just try to think, why is it on the oppressed to kind of make overtures to the oppressors? Why is it always that way? Um, and so, I, and, and I did try, um, and I regret trying. I said, well, we would just, you know, kick back and humiliate in a way, right? There's no, there's no point. There's no, there's no engagement. Um, and there needs to be recognition. And so, so my engagement now, and I have very good friends in the singular community who work on these issues, right? But because we agree, singular ethno-nationalism, the singular Buddhist nature of the state is the problem, the root of the problem, and we need to tackle that before we can um, speak about reconciliation or about accountability. That that is literally the barrier to all these things. And um, but sadly, most people can't do that. And I don't think it's it's up to us to 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 go out to the south and and, and do this sort of that label. Does anyone else? Want? So uh, I think for me, you know, I guess in terms of just that question, my mind automatically shifted to white supremacy mm -hmm. and the role that we kind of, the, the, the work that people of color do in white supremacist spaces, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's an interesting parallel between how we react to white supremacy here and Singhala mm -hmm. Buddhism on the island. I, I think for me, there are really interesting similarities in, in the ways in which that system functions, right? And, and I agree that maybe the, the labor is not on us. It's, it's almost like asking the folks that have suffered and who have been marginalized and penalized for and encountered all the violence to now turn back and say, hey, how can we work together? And, and even like even besides like the emotional side of it for me, like it's not effective, mm -hmm. if, right? Like if the question is a structural one, this country has been like legislated to give majoritarian power to a specific community. Absolutely. The fact that my Sinhala neighbor or like relative or whoever is nice to me is insufficient. And like me being like peaceful, like I'm gonna persuade one Sinhala person, the next Sinhala person to like be nice to me and maybe not, you know, burn down Muslim homes and not kill mm -hmm. the whole people. That's not gonna resolve like the the history out of which this came. It did come out of just because of like a couple of people were pissed at each other. It came out of political reorganization of the state. And it's a deeply colonial <laughs> structure yeah. and the constitu it's built into the constitution. So if we wanna start talking about cross-cultural dialogue, we need to start talking about a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. 
right? And that's not forthcoming. It's not. Yeah. It's not there. So on that point, then let's talk about. I've got a couple of questions about Rajapaksa, obviously. Um, what are your views on the current political situation in Sri Lanka with Rajapaksa? Rajapaksa was the um, president um, who oversaw the end of the war in 2009, um, and many, many war crimes have been attributed to him and to his family um, and to the ruling at his ruling party. And so now there's this constitutional crisis, which perhaps one of us can try and explain in a way that makes sense. Um, but he is uh, maybe, maybe back in power. Um, potentially returning as prime minister. Did it surprise you or did you see it as inevitable? Um, I should add, so after Raja Paksa's um, uh, regime, um, there was an election and the new president was, a uh, new political party was um, was elected. And uh, Sirisena, the new president, was supposed to be like the Sri Lankan version of Trudeau. Not as nice hair, but basically, right? Um, and it is with Trudeau's support that Raja Paksa has come in. In, this, in the last couple of weeks. So what has that meant for some of us? Has that been surprising? Has that felt inevitable? What kind of work needs to be carried out in Sri Lanka now? And would you see yourselves um, returning and congregating as a group? And the related question, what role does the international community have to stop Rajapaksa coming into power? What <coughs> policies are in place to hold the government accountable? And what can we do to ensure the other countries and or the UN intervene? So Rajapaksa, what do we do? Where do we go from? And even more, for me, more than just Roger Bucks, what do we do with like a Sarasena who's willing to let this slide? Um, I mean, I think we've all been asked, you know, in different circles, what's happening in Sri Lanka is happening in Sri Lanka. Honestly, the answer for me is I don't care. I don't, what's happening, and what it reveals is how far the Tamil population is from the state, mm -hmm. right? It was similar to in a, the book that I'm writing, people were asking, you know, were you not going to comment on all these women being elected to Congress? And I said, no, I'm not because it's inauthentic to the population that I'm talking about, right? The marginalized, undocumented population in the United States, the Tamils in Sri Lanka, for them, electoral politics has no meaning, right? That's how far this population is from the state, because the state doesn't want them to be close to them, right? Um, what does sort of really get at me, besides this sort of misogynistic show of power happening in Parliament, is this idea, again, in Colombo, that you would be more offended by the fact that you might not be as democratic as you thought, mm -hmm. than the fact that you massacred, you know, tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. right? And this is how strong this language is, the language of democracy, and the language of how much people buy into it, not only buy into it, but how much it is your sense of self, right? And when you attack something that's someone's sense of self, you can tell by this reaction that's happened in Colombo now that this, we, can, we, we can't be undemocratic, right? We can massacre Tamils, but we can't be undemocratic. So I think for me, that's the most disturbing aspect of it. In terms of whether we would go back, I don't, I don't know. It's up in the air. And again, it's not because of us. Well, you know, I know, you know we all know we'll always be fine. Right? We'll always be protected. But, you know, we had such a, a beautiful space where we were able to welcome activists and writers and early researchers into the home that we were just to come by and have conversations. And I don't know that we'd be able to do that again, depending on, on what happens, in a way that doesn't threaten them, right? You've already had... You know, it's it's like this sort of red and blue count in the United States when the when votes are being tallied. It doesn't really matter who wins in the end because what this is showing is how deeply divided this nation is. No matter what happens, at least half the population backs this guy, right? And so that's going to lead to something. That makes me think of Toronto politics. So for those of you coming from the states, we had an election recently, um, and the third runner up is an openly known neo-Nazi, like open. She was like posing with the police and she came third. So that is the city w that we live in and that you know proclaims itself as multiculturalist. Like I think I share your sort of like, we get into the nitty gritty of like this election happened and then that election and then this politician and, and I'm like, and the broader picture of like state violence and of state like the, the depoliticization of marginalized people continues when we get lost in the weeds. We like, what is it? Like you lose sight of the forest because you're focusing on the trees. Mm -hmm. But do you guys want to add anything about the Rajas? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, there is the issue, as Nimi said, and that, you know, most people I speak, there is a general sense of apathy amongst Tamils, where there's this, like, <laughs> like, it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, Rajapaksa would be worse. I'm not going to say that he would be, you know, the same as Sirius Sena. We were able to do the work that we're doing because the government had changed. But as people have said again and again, this is not change. This is just a temporary kind of relief of pressure, right? This could come back anytime. 
And yes, we did predict, we said this would happen. I wrote a piece just, I think, a week before it happened or something, where I said, this is inevitable. Because this is this is not about Rajapaksa, this is about Singapore, this nationalism, mm -hmm. right? As soon as there's a government, like the UNP or something, that kind of opens up a bit of, you know, implements more liberal, liberal policies or something like that, there'll be a backlash. This has happened throughout the last 70 years. And I think this is, you know, the role of the international community is everyone, I think I think a lot of the countries, a lot, they're like, where are the Tamils? Why is no one saying anything? You guys suffered the most from him. And we were speaking about this guy earlier who was tweeting, Alan Keenan from the ICT, he was tweeting about how he oh, tweeted his public. So <laughs> you can tweet. It's, it is being recorded. Though, yeah, I know, I know. But, you know, we've <laughs> had these arguments about it many times. But uh, it was surely... Tamils this would can't be the worst moment for Tamils. <laughs> yeah, 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 something like that. As in, all be grateful because you know they're only punching you; they're not, you know, mm -hmm. kicking you. So it's this, this, this yeah. twisted logic, right? Yeah. Um, and and you know, when when I do meet with you know the international community, with governments or whatever, I just say, as, as, for as long as you do not refuse to uh, to address single Buddhist nationalism, this is going to keep happening. You're not going to have your partner in South Asia, or you know. Yeah, the language of reconciliation now that you're seeing, once you buy into that, there's a human cost to it. Now, what did you do in the past three years? Everybody was like, oh, the rights activists should come out and engage in reconciliation and democracy and everything's wonderful now. Now what? You put hundreds and hundreds of people's lives at risk, right? Who now have to go, all these mothers have disappeared, everybody has to go underground because they believe your bullshit reconciliation. Um, do you want to No. Um, we've got two questions about caste. Um, were you able to connect with people working on anti-caste issues? If so, what did that work look like in that time? Um, for example, with the military presence and synchronization. Um, and do you believe that caste played a significant role in the downfall of the LTTE slash Tamil resistance? Going, I think this this makes me think of the questions we've been asked about, like community and like identity and belonging and tension. What do we do with these differences within our own communities? So I, I can start. Um, so I ended up in Batiklo in the eastern province in, two, in 1999 uh, to 2001. And during that time, Karuna was in charge of the, that particular wing of the LTTE. And um, there were stories about how Karuna ran his camp how it was very caste based, etc. And maybe you should explain who Karuna is. Karuna was the second in command of the LTTE and he ran the eastern province, the battalion. Um, and he, his camp was called Topikale. Uh, and it was a pretty powerful uh, force. And I think a lot of the Sri Lankan military was really scared of him. Um, and so the internal dynamics within the within the LTTE, and this is only based on rumors and stories that I heard from the clients that I was working with, but the inter internal dynamics was that it was hierarchical in terms of caste, even though the top echelons or the higher uh, officials had this line about not being caste-based. So I think the caste divisions were really prevalent within the LTTE. And, you know, I think this is something that we have to talk about, right? And we have to kind of put it on the table and we need to kind of dissect it and think about it. And there's also the added uh, issue of the Hill Country Tamil folks who are the indentured laborers who were brought to Sri Lanka by the colonial masters, especially the British, uh, who were... Uh, not given citizenship, and they had to, well, to escape their plight, they had to, uh, they left, and some of them ended up in these spaces in Vanni or in Vatiklo, and they were the ones that were being sent out to the front line, right? So again, there's a nationalist uh, uh, identity that, that was kind of prevalent, and then there was caste-based identities. So I, I don't know, I guess, it, how do we deal with it? I, I'm not sure. But I think one way to deal with it is to kind of recognize it and point to it. And Do you see it in Toronto? Do you see it in Toronto? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when my father was alive, he would, you know, and he was super casteist. And he would point out who was from which caste. And he was one of the most educated people that I knew, right? And so even amongst the educated caste, 
for the educated folks, caste play, played a prevalent role in terms of marriage, in terms of who you associated with, in terms of behavior, right? Um, so I think it's it's everywhere. It's it's part of our communities, and this is something that we never want to talk about. Yeah, I think um, the questions when I asked questions about caste or anti caste work that was happening, it was um, met with hostility, right? Uh, you know, oh, these Indian raw agents are kind of stare this casting up, but you know, really the LTT got rid of the caste problem kind of narrative, right? It's especially prevalent in the diaspora. I think people in the Northeast are a bit more real. <laughs> Come on, yeah, everyone does look at caste here. Um, which is you know, also problematic because you know they put a lid on it, they didn't resolve it, right? And it is an issue in activism. So when, for example, um, there's a Kerpapala land protest where uh, the military is occupying you know, huge amounts of land and the people who lived on that land were protesting outside it. And this was in an area formerly held by the LTT. And, um, and I went to the protest and I noticed the people sitting in the tent, similar to the protest that we went to, um, and another group of people sitting outside under a tree. And, uh, and then food came, and they were cooking, but food came for this group. And I was like, what's going on? And so I went to sit with these other people, and I started speaking to them, and I realized they speak a bit different. They were upcountry origin people who had come to the Vatney in the 50s. Um, and then it became clear to me, this is, you know, this is a caste-based division. So it is there, it is, you know, it's, it's, it's in all these spaces. And I think, especially in activist spaces, um, in the diaspora, for example, if you look at the organizations, we should, we should, I think we should do a survey and see how many are not non royal men, right, who are leading these, mm -hmm. these organizations or who are active in these spaces. Um, and it's the same on the ground. You know, the people who are activists, the people who are politicians, they're either Valhalla or they are, you know, henchmen in kind of their communities, right? Um, and this is where the EPDP and other kind of paramilitary groups and... Uh, explain what EPDP is. Uh, the EPDP is the Ulan People's Democratic Party. They were a nasty group, uh, paramilitary, who were working with the Rajapaksa government and for, you know, years before that with whoever, whichever government was in power to, to fight the LTT. They were abducted and running uh, rack extortion rackets. Um, um, and because they had the support of the government, they were able to provide jobs. So I'm from a village in, on, on the eastern coast uh, of, of the Jaffna Peninsula. There's a lot of sand there. So e the EPDP would basically run these rackets where they just used to steal the sand. And uh, people were killed over it. So after the, in 2012, I think one of, uh, uh, one of our neighbors was killed because he was protesting against it, saying, you know, you should, you, you should stop taking the land. Because that sand actually saved the village from the tsunami, right? Because there's sand dunes, there's huge sand dunes. You, you don't see a place like that in, in, the, in the rest of the island. Um, so that's the sort of thing that the EPDP does, uh, or did. And now they're back in power. Um, so when Rajapaksa came in, the first thing he did is he, he appointed Douglas Dervanatha as a minister again. Um, but what the EPDP does do, what the other parties don't do, is they go into the oppressed communities that of uh, oppressed caste communities and they go and they offer jobs and they build wells and they do that sort of thing. And that's how they've been maintaining kind of the electoral uh, hold on, on sections, <laughs> especially in the peninsula but also in other places. That reminds me of a conversation that's been happening in Toronto around the failure of the left to mobilize, racialize, low wage immigrant communities in Toronto. Like we keep talking about this an assumption that, you know, racialized peoples are necessarily more conservative, less leftist than their white counterparts, and really that's reflective of the failure of the white left to mobilize or to treat people with that dignity and respect, and the savviness of conservative and of right-wing groups to know that it is on the base of people's oppressions that you can manipulate them and exploit that, right? Yeah. Did you want to add anything to that, Amy? No. Please work on it more than me. Um, this is a factual question for all of us. Um, can you tell us more about the workshops you led in Jaffna um, how did you frame your approach? To teach less and listen more, how did you distinguish your approach from the limited approaches to reconciliation and transitional justice of other entities like the government and NGOs? So how are workshops different from, from NGOs? Uh, well, we didn't host workshops. We didn't present workshops. We didn't. When I knew that we were going there, I spoke to a lot of the folks on the island who were doing student activism or whatever, and I said, listen, these people are going to be there. You know, it felt to me when you had different kinds of expertise and, you know, in various areas of the academy, law, whatever, if you want us to contribute something, we will and, you know, be happy to do lectures or workshops or whatever. 
but we didn't do anything that, that wasn't you know, something that the students organized and asked us to do, and they were requests that we weren't entirely, you know, there was the request that we got was a, a workshop on research methodology, right, which is not a terribly exciting subject, but we did it because um, that was what they felt that they needed, right, and you had like 200 people like packed in this room listening to a workshop on research methodology. Um, there was one ongoing conference that was already happening on activism, and they asked us to do um, Fatima, myself, and Dilo uh, a section on a session on mobilizing and gender. Um, for me, I can say that the workshops, you know, I went to all of them, and I thought they were all great. But I think that for me and my own work, um, being able to see Dilo, who's a close friend and a transgender actor, break open what gender looks like for the Tamil society and really seeing the consciousness shift through comedy. Um, you know, he would have like 200 aunties under a tree in Vatico, like very serious, wearing saris, and I'm looking at him like, how is he going to pull this off? Like, you have to imagine speak. Dilo. He's like walking in wearing like shorts. often shorts. <laughs> Bag, unless there was a fight about hat, it. Backwards yeah. hat. Like, yeah, he's the... And it's comedy right. too, right? And Dilo doesn't speak Tamil. Right? Dilo is Tamil, but he doesn't speak Tamil. So this would all have to be translated in order for it to work. and. You know, and it speaks to his skill, I think, as a communicator because he, you know, chose the exact right story about a swami and an auntie, and, a, and you had two hundred aunties who were just, you know, laughing hysterically at this. So I think um, there wasn't an approach to be the answer. It wasn't injury. It wasn't anything. It was whatever the students asked of us that we did, and then each of those workshops sort of led into to folks coming by and having longer conversations, or joining us for dinner, or joining us for breakfast. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that we all learned a lot from them as mm -hmm. well. So. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to go through the next three questions a bit, or next three segments a bit quickly. Um, so this question is, in diaspora politics, I absorb a lot of, observe a lot of performing, um, particularly in pro-tiger spaces, and, the, and their active alienation of those who may not be necessarily pro-tiger, but are still pro thermal justice. Can you comment on this? So I guess, is there a distinction to, be, to draw between being pro thermal justice and pro tiger, what might that look like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> so I guess I this is something that I've been struggling with and I've been trying to write about for quite a bit because I think there's often a conflation between being pro thermal pro LTTE, pro Tamil nationalists, and, I, and I'm not so sure that these labels work for me, right? And I'm not going to play this game it's anymore. It's so clear of you. These labels, yeah. they just don't work. <laughs> they just don't work. I love it, though. I love it. No, but they, it's true, though, yeah. right? Like, because in, in whatever space that I go to, I have to explain that I'm not pro LTTE, or I'm not pro Tamil nationalism, or I'm not pro this, or I'm not pro that. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Right, I, you know, at the end of the day, um, for me, for me, what's really important is that I need to figure out my own own politics in terms of all of this, and my own politics is that look, I left my home to come and settle on these territories which are not my home, and I've had to experience all of these violent, violent experiences as a racialized queer man in this space as a result of that conflict. And yes, the Thumbies were there to protect me when <laughs> the Thumbies are the, the LTTE soldiers, were there to protect me when I was running from the bullets that were falling in my playground when I was seven or eight, right? And so there's this kind of visceral reaction initially of like, no, I'm not pro-LTTE, but I sympathize. Well, yes, they did all of these horrible things to my friends and my family members, and yes, they you know did all of these wonderful things to other people that I know and I don't know, I think we need to kind of transcend this because this is paralyzing, and I think we're kind of playing the game of fitting into these boxes to so that we can get the grants we can get the Right? And I, I don't know, I, I, there has to be a better way. I think of when, in 2009, in May, I was in Sri Lanka in, in Portugal with my family. And it was a really, um, like, 
probably like life changing moment if you can identify those where it was like my family is like Muslim. They um, <coughs> when I was a child, the tigers came by our house and tried to like you know recruit people. Um, mm -hmm. And yet these were, these were also people who had stories of supporting the tigers, right? Of like having joined the tigers or people who were like were killed because they were seen one day by the IPKF, the Indian Peacekeeping Force, um, or themselves an occupying force, were seen to have given lunch to a tiger cadre. Like, and I think that that moment, those conversations were so crystallizing for me because I was like, right, like, there's there's no neat box, there's no like checking here or there, yes or no around this stuff. Like the tigers were a protective force in a particular moment, and the way that they came up, there's a lot to critique. There is a lot of violence like that happened. Um, in that process, but also like this is in the in the context of a larger problem with respect to the state. For me, the the sense has been what has felt generative was like people being able to say in this moment on this particular action, I say this, I take this particular position, and I, my broader politic is one as this question has framed it of pro criminal justice and pro justice, and I, I'm trying to stay true to that, and that will be contextual. Um, these are organizations that change with time. Um, but, yeah, Mary, yeah. No, and I think it's it's. I mean, for me, it's it also crystallized for me more once I started having more conversations in in the northeast. And I was afraid. I was like, mm, I grew up in a very pro LGBT kind of environment, and you know, I, I was. I mean, I, I still am in some ways. And going to Sri Lanka, or going to the northeast in particular, um, you know, this thing it, you do internalize it, right? All the criticism that you get from other people, like you don't know, you don't know what's going, really going on out there, right? Um, but I think what I'm, I'm I'm confident to say that the majority the majority of people do have a you know uh, a critical view of the LTT, but I also still support it. Right? It's not it can't be boxed like that. Um, and this boxing thing, I think it's especially an issue in Toronto. It's probably the most toxic tunnel space I've been in, uh, having lived it before. <laughs> but um, it's bad, and I don't know why it's so bad here. Um, but in 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 London and other places, it's just not that bad. There's still this control where you're like, oh, you're critical of the LGBT, so you're anti-Tamil nationalism or you're anti-Tamil justice or things like that. Um, but I think these things have just become more and more irrelevant. You just, yeah, you know, in the, in the last three days, I was accused of being a terrorist sympathizer um, uh, who is, you know, and basically LGBT outside and doesn't know anything about what's going on on one side. And on the other hand, there were Tamils accusing me of having given up on Tamilism, right? Uh... So, you know, it's, 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 and I'm like, you know, I, you can both go fuck yourself, I don't care, right? Um, and we just, we just do what we do. And I, I, I mean, for me, I'm trying to be as reflective of my, of my experiences with people there. And this is, and, and this is the thing, I mean, what does it mean to be Tamil? What does the Tamil nation include? What, you know, who's included? Who's not, in, you know, same, you know, similar experience that I've had in staying in, in this last, the last trip was the first time I stayed in a Muslim village and people were saying there, I was like, Shit, this was a completely different space like 20 years ago where these people were harboring and sheltering tigers at their own risk and they lost a lot of people because of that, right? Uh, and so those people's frustrations with the Tamils, I think they were like, yeah, we did all this and then you turned on us, right? So there's, also, there's no conversation about that happening amongst the Tamil community, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is something that we should definitely have, have more open and more uh, frank conversations about um, on our own. No, as, as Nimi said, there's no point in bringing so, um, uh, no, I have people on stage in my face, and I can say anything on my back, but um, the only thing I would add to that is just the gender element to it, that, um, you know, particularly for young women activists, to just always be cautious of the ways in which these things become calculated ways to dismiss you, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a number of ways that people do it, and you have to keep on being able to recognize that this is what they're doing, right? when they say you're being too negative, but you're actually just being critical, when they say you're too nationalist, but you're actually kind of representing an authentic sort of perspective of people. Um, it's done in a lot of ways, but to just be cautious that this is one of those ways of dismissing your own sort of political platform. So on the question of like how we craft our politics, I think this question is useful. Where do you read to learn about Sri Lanka and the conflict? I feel like second generation, second generation Tamil folks have a hard time learning um, this history outside of academia and not by white people too. That's the, that's the request. Mm -hmm. What are you reading these days? I mean, I read a lot of narrative nonfiction. So um, I don't like stuff by Indians on Sri Lanka. Um, 
you know, we, we did read a lot of academic work, but I think that I'm lucky and that I've been able to be exposed to the actual writings of the fighters and the poetry and that kind of stuff. I think part of the purpose of Mario and I and others you know, working on the archive is to make that material available to more people because it does feel like there's not enough direct source mm -hmm. material. Right? Um, and there's such beautiful writing. I mean, some of the poetry of the fighters, some of the um, memoirs, that kind of stuff, right? Um, in terms of history, kind of on the on the fighters, I like Adele's work, um, Balzingham, because it really is just kind of an embedded view of what it was. I think she writes in a really clear. Who was she? Adele Balzingham is the wife of the Anton Balzingham, the political strategist of, of the fighters. Um, but it's kind of, I mean, I think again, it's 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 not Sri Lanka. It's like again, your political project, right? Mm -hmm. So I read a lot about, you know, women in the FARC or gender and militancy, or about women in Kashmir. But again, the stories that come out the narrative nonfiction, and all of those things help inform how I think about Sri Lanka. So I read Nimi's work. I read Fatima's work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read. Uh, I I recently found uh, this Tamil historian. At Cambridge, his name is Sujit. It's funny how everyone's oh. named Sujit. <laughs> Sujit Sivasundram. Uh, he's pretty awesome. He has a new book out called Island. I don't know if it's new. I think it came out in, recently. Um, and um, so I'm reading that right now. Uh, and I think in terms of the stuff that I'm reading, I'm currently working on a project trying to think about the role of administrative law uh, in the northern and uh, northern and eastern province of Sri Lanka, and so I'm reading a lot of archival stuff uh, or a lot of historians who are white uh, folks who are either Portuguese or Dutch, uh, and uh, thinking through what the uh, Portuguese and the Dutch have done in setting up that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, that's the most recent uh, uh, pieces that I, I've been kind of looking at. Uh, but there's tons of other folks, Sivanandan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Sivanandan's work is, I think, one of the Who most, he? uh, he's a critical race uh, scholar, uh, Sri Lankan Tamil, uh, who ended up in uh, the UK, and he he participated in a lot of the British uh, critical race conversations, and he uh, he headed the Centre for Race and Class in London, and he recently passed. And uh, a friend of mine, when I first moved back to Sri Lanka in 1998, uh, gifted me. Uh, a, a copy of When Memory Dies. And I think that was one of the most important pieces that I read that shifted my thinking around Tamilness. Uh, it, uh, I think it was quite uh, powerful. Uh, I've all, you know, The Broken Palmera, for example, is another piece that I, I often sometimes go back to. I know it's people may not like her, uh, but I, I like it. It was formative for me. So. So, um, A. Sivanandan um, died last year, um, based in London, and he was a contemporary of Stuart Hall's, so people may have heard of Stuart Hall, right? Um, and his work, Sivanandan's work on like race and class in the UK in uh, the 70s and 80s is phenomenal. It is like, and just listening to him speak, he's this incredible orator, definitely someone to look to, um, and someone that like, when I think of like leftist uh, uh, histories in the Tamil movement, um, in, among Tamil peoples, um, definitely, like in the English language in particular, like he really stands out as a beacon. So I would strongly recommend him. Um, I don't read that Shalin. much, but huh? Shalin. Hmm. Shalin's work. Shalin. Oh, Shalin. Um, you, you mean the journalist? Yeah, all, yeah. It's all in Tamil, but that's it's it. All in Tamil. I mean, the, the the issue is that a lot of the a lot of the good detailed stuff is in Tamil, and I struggle to read in in Tamil. I can barely read headlines, and I think I stop at that. Um, but some stuff does get translated. But there's also quite a lot of stuff made number of Tamil scholars. Um, so there's a book which has been quite uh, uh, useful for me in kind of the research that I'm doing now. It's called Tamils in the Nation, uh, written by uh, Dr. Madhurika Rasaratnam. She's a UK-based uh, 
scholar, an activist. She used to be with the Tom Guardian too, and still is involved in some way. Um, and um, and she kind of maps the kind of development of Tamil nationalism in in India, where it went basically from like we want independence to yeah we are the second wealthiest state in India, uh, and kind of the opposite trajectory that uh, Tamils in in Sri Lanka had. Um, and um, Wasi's reading is really interesting book. Well, uh, it's printed in 1963. It's called Satyagraha, um, and it was written by a guy called Ponneya. It was printed in Jaffna. It's you know back in the day when <laughs> Jaffna had printers and book publisher. Um, but it's just so interesting how similar the demands and the requests and the language used and everything is to what it is now. It's, it's fascinating, and this isn't available anywhere online. Or you know, I'm, I'm, I will PDF it at some point and uh, put it up somewhere. Uh, but um, she yeah, had just just the way the protests are described, and it's like we're there, we're there now, we're there. What what they were trying to do in the 1950s and 60s is what uh, what we're basically facing facing now with the state, and and just kind of the realization that we haven't come far at all, right? Um, so on that note, actually, that's a really great place to take us into the next. Step. I'm going to read all these questions together because they're somewhat related. Um, How do we turn these intimate violences that form a political identity in people into a community of solidarity and resistance? For example, Tamil spaces, which are like, which are like alcohol as coping mechanisms, into spaces that are that mobilize political productivity. Um, relatedly, how can we learn from the experience of the colonization and state violence in Turtle Island slash Canada slash the UA and the resistance of indigenous nations of sovereign indi indigenous nations in Toronto, Ontario? across Canada or the USA to support resistance and sovereignty in the North and the East. Um, how do you stay accountable in the particular line of work that you do? What level of criticism prevents the political paralysis that we were speaking of earlier? And relatedly, finally, what are some visions for the future slash immediate goals that folks living in the East of Sri Lanka or other places that you visited there um, have in this post-war phase? post-war being in quotation marks. So what does looking forward look like? Looking forward and looking inwards. It's, it's not fair, you always look at me. Ma, <laughs> You're there. Let's start with Mario this time. Um, I think looking inward is, is, is an important thing that we have to kind of do. We're still kind of stuck in the politics of uh, and I'm talking about the Tamil community in general and Tamil nationalist politics, which is the dominant mm -hmm. politics in uh, amongst the Tamil community, and uh, what that what that means in in this day and age, what it should have meant in the 70s and 80s, in which it did it right. So you know the failures that have were done, um, and kind of the uh, Ruth when I read this, and I forgot where I read this, but there, there there was a reflection in in the 70s and 80s when the armed movements were coming up of of the past. Um, and that, that that's not happening now. That we're not looking at okay, where where did we go wrong? What what should we be doing differently? Um, and I think I mean you know, I've, I've I've just been in in Toronto for a month now or two months now, so I'm still fairly new to the place and still getting to know people and uh, kind of you know getting into the uh, kind of circles. Uh, but I'm looking forward to have more of those conversations with with people here with with others who want to be active on on on, on these issues. Um, but I mean uh, you know. The bigger picture, when it comes directly to Sri Lanka, is I mean, without without defeating, without kind of overcoming single Buddhist nationalism within the state, it's going to be very difficult to to continue living as one country. And this is, you know, when we say, "Are you pro Tamil?" I'm like, "Yeah, I am pro liberation because it's not working. Clearly, it's not working. We're at risk of violence." That doesn't mean that oh, once we have Tamil when we get it, everything's going to be fine. No, there probably there'll be a resistance within that too, right? Because no, it's not going to be fine. There's still so many issues within the community that we need to deal with. Um, I don't think this will this will end. I mean, this is definitely something that will continue. Um, I'll just say on the intimate violence and how to mobilize from there. Um, you know, I often when you talk about rape, right? And you talk about what it does to a woman. There's this idea that it makes her sad and it makes her sort of socioeconomically marginalized and whatever. Right? The argument, you know, from my work with Women and the Tigers is that it changes their politics, right? Which is not to say 
that, you know, she's raped and then she's a nationalist or she's raped and then she's a whatever. Right? That's not how it happens. But what happens in those moments is that there's a kind of extreme marginalization that happens, right, to these women that makes one reconsider the context of your life, right? The contours of your life, what justice looks like, what, you know, and for me, you know, it's a big argument in the U.S. right now, I don't think mobilizing around trauma works. You know, I think I'm you know, probably going to be hung for that one day because it's anti-me too or something, but it's not about, you know, trauma not being relevant. Trauma is relevant to women, you know, all the time, but mobilizing around trauma is not a form of power. It's not political. Right? What you saw in the U.S., for those of you following the Supreme Court you know, nominations, is that you had, you saw the, the massive failure of this. Because, you know, my work, earlier work, you know, on empowerment and white feminism in the developing world, what they did is they constructed these brown women all over the world who were, you know, sexualized, brutalized, mass rape, FGM. You know, every white feminist cause is about a sexualized violence that happens, right? And what happens is comes from the colonial times and the colonial wives' interventions you could actually trace it back to how they construct these women, um, is that the sexualized actor is not a political actor. Right? You don't expect any politics from them. So when these white women went in and decided to give them sewing machines and chickens and cows and bakeries, I think at some point they really did believe that that was power. Right? And so as this sort of gets absorbed back into the U.S. territory and U.S. social justice landscape, the white feminists have, you know, really the most powerful ones lined up and said, I was raped and I was raped and I was raped, right? And what happened? The woman who was in power made a political decision. The woman who made the final vote was a Republican, and she decided to put him in power, to put him in Supreme Court. She looked at all the trauma, and she said, yes, I hear your trauma. Who was him? Just a minute. Uh, sorry, Kavanaugh, Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court Justice. And Susan Collins said, this, you know, I have a Republican political agenda, and I'm going to follow that. right?" And it's not all, in terms of mobilizing, it's not a very far step to take. right? If you look at Tarana Burke and why she formed the Me Too movement, the reason she was raped is very different than the white woman at Yale who was raped by Brett Kavanaugh, right? And if she were to mobilize along those lines, along police brutality in the South, along alcoholism, along the school-to-prison pipeline for black people, for black women, it would be a smaller movement. It wouldn't be this sort of kumbaya of everybody was raped. It would be a smaller movement, but it would be a political movement that has a chance of standing up against forces of power that are political, right? People in power will act on political interests cannot combat that with trauma, right? And so I would only say, like, you know, you talk about this intimate violence, and again, I, I, my work comes from the perspective of working with women and tigers for, you know, I started working with them 20 years ago, and it was never about being raped. It was never about the alienation. It was never about, it was about why that happened and the politics of it and whether or not they were raped. They understood that the movement was a form of protection, right? And if you look at the U.S. right now, you know, some of the newer work I'm doing, the highest rise in people taking up arms by far is black women, right? between 2011 and 2018. Significantly higher number of black women are armed now. So I think, you know, in terms of, of mobilizing, it's about taking that next step from trauma to, to why this trauma happened. So I guess I'll pick up on two aspects. And one is this idea that nationhood or what are we looking f forward to and I, I don't know I, I guess for me in some ways I've been thinking a lot about statehood for a very very long time for almost 20 years now and I don't know I'm not so sure that statehood is the answer statehood is for anyone right uh, uh, I don't know I think if you think about the indigenous communities here or the Palestinians, or the Sri Lankan Tamils, or other folks that are seeking some form of self-determination. I don't, because the way international law conceptualizes statehood, it's, it's conceptualized in a Westphalian space where territory, government, independence, all of these things come together to form a national polity. And I'm not so sure that that's where we want to go, because why do we want to replicate a colonial infrastructure? Why do we want to kind of reimagine uh, a state structure in that way, now that we know all of the harms that colonialism kind of produces? So in some ways, I'm, I'm kind of inspired by a lot of my indigenous colleagues who've been thinking about solidarities and thinking back to their own people and the ways in which they're they're asking for governance, 
And I, I think there might be something there to kind of push and pull and tear apart. And I think that's where, in some ways, a lot of productive work can happen. And, and I, I think, you know, in terms of folks that are thinking about this, uh, we need to kind of create, we as academics, activists, we need to create spaces in which these kinds of conversations can happen. Because I don't think these conversations are happening because the Tamil uncles are taking over. And they they don't let you speak, right? So, <laughs> well, I, I I in some ways might be the Tamil uncle too, right? So, <laughs> and which then leads me to the second point, which is accountability. How am I being accountable, and how am I kind of working through these issues? And I, mean, I don't know. I think there's something to be said about being super reflexive and reflective. Um, I think often we reflect on an, on a, on a experience after it happens, but we don't think about it as it's unfolding. And for me, this is something that I try to do with with everything that I'm kind of committed to is to kind of reflect on what it is that I'm I really want to do and what what are the politics of the conversations that we're having. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm kind of drawn to this project because I think it's it's collaborative, it's co it's building communities. And yeah, we don't all agree. And we don't all come to this from the same experience, right? And But yet, we are able to sit around a table and have these productive conversations without letting the paralysis take over. And I think for me, that's productive. And that allows me to be a good teacher and to kind of help those folks who take my classes or who come to me for, for I guess, guidance, kind of generate a space in which this can happen because I, I didn't have that space coming up, right? A lot of the Tamil intellectuals were either murdered by the LTTE or they were murdered by the Sri Lankan state. And so there was no one that we can look to to kind of think about, well, what are the intellectual opportunities or what are the intellectual trajectories that we can embark on, right? That wasn't there. And so I think the role for us as public intellectuals, in some ways, is to generate that space. And I think this project, kind of bringing it back to this space, allows us to do that work. And you're all going to write beautiful pieces from that experience. So you're going in the book that we'll have out next week. Um, I was asked, I was at a talk um, at Windsor Law on Monday, a few days ago, and students there, they had asked, uh, a, they put together a panel about like sexual violence, and they were like, what can we do, it was a surprise, a room mostly of women, what can we do um, to combat sexual violence? And you know, the other speakers had suggestions, and I have really, I, I've been thinking about how grateful I am that my last two years have been devoted in my legal practice to labor law, to, to union side law. And there are problems with the union movement but in terms of the question of loneliness that Nimi started us off with, I think about this as like a, a politics of the collective. And my response to students was like, you know, you mobilize and you organize as collectives. Like, the reason I'm glad I I'm doing labor law now and not immigration or criminal law, which is what I started off with, is that those areas of law were so individualized, right? I was like representing one client and trying to like, try not to get them into jail, or you're representing one person, trying to get them a status claim here. Whereas as a worker collective, whether that's a unionized context or not, to go out and be like, we will withdraw our labor. You cannot, you cannot continue, but for our labor, that begins from a position of strength and power. And I think that's what Nimi was, was reminding me of in her comments, to begin from a position of power rather than traumatization. Not to say that traumatization doesn't happen to us, but that we find these collectivities and then we stand together, we stand with each other, which I think is also what these questions are signaling towards. Because not just like standing together across the differences within Tamil movements, um, within the Tamil nation, but also across communities, when fundamentally some of the violences that we're experiencing, whether in Palestine or in Turtle Island or in Tamil Elam, wherever it is, are so, so like familiar. Like at some point we need to be able to connect those dots. But that requires, I think, us will being willing to take risks and put our put our own privileges benefits um, on the line in a way that I think Canadian multiculturalism teaches us not to, right? Like we can just move up the ranks and become politicians. We have conservative MPs, we have conservative MPs who are Tamil, who are Muslim, who are immigrants. That is disgusting. <laughs> but it but it works. But it works, right? Like these are people who are out there being like Tamil workers 
don't deserve $15 an hour. That to me is an issue of thermal politics. And I think beginning, beginning from that position of like, here we have strength, we will mobilize collectively on our strength, and we will figure it out from there. Because I think people often ask, what is it? What is the next step? What are we working towards? I honestly don't know. I don't know what it looks like, but I know that having these conversations and and not just having the conversation, but being like, what is it that I give up? Um, what cred do I give up? What social status do I give up? Collectively, we will be able to figure it out together um, in the face of really extreme amounts of violence, both here, but also on the island. So to that end, thank you so much. I feel like this, this conversation really proves out.